All right. Thank you for joining our service dog handler chat. We are back with special guest, Pine Irwin. And so during this chat, um, just to help with flashiness, because some people that are watching may have seizures and whatnot, we ask that you stay muted um, and raise your hand, either physically by putting your hand up in front of the camera or with the reactions, or you can type a question in the chat box. And so then, you know, we can give you the floor to talk. We're happy to have other voices join in the conversation. We just want it to be one at a time so that we're not flashing back and forth between two people. And so I have heard a lot of great feedback from our last chat with Pine, where we talked about a lot of the myths that were in force free training. Today, we're going to talk more specifically on service dogs and some of the myths that are in service dogs. And so, Pine, I know you introduced yourself the last time, but if you want to do just a quick introduction in case we have anybody new watching, go right ahead. Hi, guys. I'm Pine Irwin. Um, that's Irwin with an I, like Steve Irwin, but no relation. I'm a multi-certified um, dog trainer and behavior specialist. I specialize in dealing with all kinds of reactivity, aggression, that kind of thing. I'm also an outdoor adventurist. Um, so I spend a lot of time on the trail um, with my dogs, camping, backpacking, all of that. And I am a service dog handler. Um, I am on my third service dog um, right now. So I'm really excited to talk today about dealing with some of the um, myths and misconceptions that come into service dog training. Um, I have multiple clients whose dogs I'm helping them train as service dogs and companions and things like that um, for a variety of things. I've also trained dogs for therapy work and stuff like that, which arguably I think might even be harder than service dogs. Um, there's a lot of expectation on those guys. So I'm really excited. Um, if y'all have a question for me, just raise your hand virtually, flash the camera. Um, I don't, I will try to make sure we get to it. I'm excited to be here and I'm not as caffeinated as I need to be. So excuse me. Yeah. I was kind of thinking the same thing. I was looking around and surveying my water intake and <laughs> I might have to pop out and get something. Yeah. So, um, we kind of want to just focus service dog world stuff. And if you have a myth that you would like us to chat about, please feel free to put it in the chat box. Yes. We're start with a big one that I hear all the time. And I know there are several in our group that were told this by um, other trainers and whatnot as well, but has since like realized that it was not the way to go. So the big myth um, is that, first of all, starting with, there's the myth that some disabled or disabled people simply cannot train their own dog because if they're disabled, they don't have the skills to do so. That's not the one we're looking at. <laughs> um, what we want to look at is that along with that, it's the myth that physical disabilities can justify the use of punitive techniques and aversive tools. And um, I have permission to tell a little bit of a story to put this out and what we mean by this. And so we do have a group member who is wheelchair bound and was struggling with teaching his dog not to jump on people because the dog was too excited greeting new people. Young, young dog. Um, I think he was under a year old at the time or she was under a year old at the time. And so he called on a friend who he knew was a dog trainer to do a board and train and help this dog to stop jumping. And during that time, even though it was a friend and he didn't realize what was going on, the board and train person put a shock collar on the dog. And then when she returned the dog, dog was still wearing the shock collar and she handed him a remote and said, when, he go, when you give him permission to greet, if he starts to jump, push this button. And the guy was just like absolutely appalled. And she's like, with your disability, this is the only way you can teach this dog to not jump on people. He said he tried it just once. He pushed the button once, um, like she was instructing while she was there. And he said he will never, ever, ever push that button again. We'll never put that collar on his dog again. 
And guess what? He figured out a different way to teach the dog not to jump on people. <laughs> so yes, his, his dear friend and dog trainer told him, with your disability, it's okay to hurt your dog in this situation. And I know Pine agrees with me and I'm gonna actually let her do most of the talking here, but under no circumstances is it ever ethically okay to hurt our dogs intentionally because we don't like what they're doing. I, and I'm not saying maybe you might not have to restrain your dog for a medical procedure. You know, maybe they need a foot bandaged or something. I'm not talking about restraint. I'm talking about all out punishing them for doing something that we don't like. And so with that, Pine, you want to share some thoughts? So the first thought is we have to understand what punishment is. From a scientific perspective, punishment is a stimulus applied to a learner, in this case a dog, that decreases a behavior. So if it is decreasing, it is by nature punishing. In the case of this um, particular example, we're talking about what we would call positive punishment. We have applied the stimulus ourselves. We have incurred force upon it, and that will decrease the behavior. In this case, the jumping up on somebody. Um, FYI, under the best of circumstances, that is a fantastic way to almost guarantee your dog does not like strangers. Like that is like the fastest way possible to ensure that your dog becomes stranger reactive, stranger danger. Um, because every time they meet a new person, they get excited and then they get punished. And so what is the likely outcome of that? The likely outcome is that the dog associates that with new people. Now they're no longer excited to meet new people. In fact, they're dreading meeting new people. Um, it's really not appropriate. Um, so scientifically, punishment is the apply application of a stimulus to decrease a behavior. Um, in this case, this is positive punishment. The dog does the behavior we don't like. We punish them. They stop doing that behavior. Um, in the case of something like negative punishment, we'd see like force fetch, which where the stimuli, the uh, punishment is applied, the, the shock is applied, and it is continued applied until the dog does X behavior. Um, it basically saying, if you don't do this, everything else is pain. Um, awesome. Not great. Um, <laughs> psychologically speaking. So, and in this circumstance, this, um, this punishment, et cetera, when we apply punishment after the fact, um, we are engaging in an act of retaliation. Um, punishment is retaliation. So when we, when a dog does X and we punish them, we are retaliating. We are not teaching. We are just retaliating. And I'm not talking about your dog suddenly does something. You're like, oh my God, Fluffy, don't do that. It's a very different human reaction. That is not a teaching moment. That is just a reaction. It's, it's separate. Obviously we should try to avoid doing those things, but stuff happens. We're only human. You know, it's like, um, parents with young children, their child does something and they scream at them not to do it because, oh my God, it's really scary. That is not a learning moment for that kid. That is an emergency moment. You know, I run in and grab a dog and yank them out of a situation that's going to be dangerous. I'm not teaching them a dang thing. What I'm doing is removing them from a situation. Um, Penny's example with the vet, you know, when I have to take a dog into the emergency vet and I have to restrain them pretty forcefully to deal with an, an emergent situation, that is a very different thing from me coming in there and telling them, you'll just put up with me trimming your nails. Cause I'm going to hog tie you and pin you down. That's a very different set of circumstances. So being a force-free trainer does not mean you are a perfect person. It does not mean you never react negatively and go just like knock it off, dog. You know, we never, we're human. We make mistakes. It means that our training and our teaching paradigm does not intentionally cause these things, that we do not intentionally set out to cause this thing. If I'm holding the end of the leash and my dog bolts at the end of the leash and hits it, racks himself, that is technically a positive punishment because he's going to learn like, eh, I probably should do that again. That sucked, but I didn't apply that. Right. I, I wasn't intentionally setting up the scenario to cause that. Another big factor here is in the circumstance, especially the example that Penny gave, what we had done is we had intentionally set this dog up to fail. We had very purposely put this dog into an environment where reacting in a way that we found inappropriate was highly likely so that we could put the e-collar on 
and shock the dog and punish them for doing the thing we knew they were going to do. So we, we, we created a scenario and then we had the audacity to punish the dog for it. So that is all of that coming into leading into this idea that because someone has physical challenges or different ability to use their body or a lack of motility or a lack of muscle control, that somehow justifies going further down into the realm of force. Well, first big problem with that is we are asking service dogs to be our lifeline, right? We are putting a lot of faith and trust in these dogs to, in many cases, be responsible for keeping us safe and alive, for alerting to changes in cardiacs. Um, so, signals, changes in blood sugar, changes in biochemistry of the brain, changes in heart rhythm, changes in, you know, stress chemicals, changes in whether or not it's safe to cross the street. We are, we are asking these animals to, we are asking them to be trustworthy with our lives. We are literally putting our lives in their hand. And the worst thing you can do for that relationship is simultaneously come down on them with a shot collar or a prong collar and say, no, you did it wrong. I'm supposed to trust you with my life. I'm supposed to believe you when you say we can't walk across the street right now because a car's coming. But how is a dog to say that? And I think we're going to get into that, that whole element of cognitive disobedience in a little bit. So when we're physically challenged and we don't know how to get the things we need done, that first of all, call a professional. Yeah. Yeah. We're out here, um, to help, but it doesn't justify that. It, it especially doesn't justify it because we have done the same thing to humans with different abilities. We've done things to humans with cognitive disabilities, with, um, mental health challenges, with, with physical disabilities for, for centuries, we've done terrible, terrible things to those humans. And we would all universally agree putting a shock collar on an, on an autistic kid is like, absolutely a no-go, but we think it's okay to do it on a dog. You know, I, I, I always challenge people, like, if it's not that bad, put it on your two-year-old. And you'd be surprised how many people <laughs> get really upset about that, but your dog's cognitive abilities is about there with the average two to three-year-old. That's about where they are. And if we think it's appalling to do it to a three-year-old human, a three-year-old human who gets excited because his friends are coming over or the relatives are coming to visit, grandma's coming over and he's super excited. And you think it's, you would think it was absolutely horrific to put a shot collar on that kid to make them calm down, right? And let's set aside the fact it doesn't calm anyone down. Cindy, you have a question. I do. Um, so. I, I obviously am a force-free trainer. And do you think, aside from we don't want to do punishment because punishment is, you know, has lots of fallout. Yeah. Do you find it's easier working with clients that are using, especially the, dis the disabled that may have physical issues using a force-free manner? I don't. Uh, uh, so uh, let me understand. You're saying that is it more challenging for people who might be physically ch disabled or have some physical challenges for them to work force free than it is for no? Is it Usain the Bolt? opposite? Is it easier for them to work force free than that for them to even ever consider going the other route? I actually think cognitively sometimes it is. Um, in terms of their understanding of what's happening, I think their perspective and oftentimes their life experiences within dealing with chronic health conditions, especially those that require significant amount of surgical or medical intervention when they're young, I find that those, they often have a great deal of compassion um, and a great deal of empathy and sympathy for these dogs and they kind of get it. Um, in a, in a, in a cognitive way, they might not necessarily know how to go about it mechanically, but at least they understand from a cognitive perspective, like I would hate this being done to me, or I had similar things done to me when I was too young to, you know, any, for anybody to take my objection seriously. I don't want to put a dog through that. So I do find that, um, the challenges, the most challenging, um, people I find are people who are struggling with mental health concerns and are looking for psychiatric assistance in a dog. They are often much more rigid in their thinking and have a much harder time breaking from oftentimes because they've already tried it the old way. Um, 
and they or they learned they learned by watching Caesar Milan or some somebody else of that caliber or lack thereof um and they they have a harder time grasping this idea that that you know we can we can do it a different way and not only will this way be better for our dog it'll be more effective long term um and i do i do find that a lot of people who struggle with intermittent problems so um people who have uh, physical physical stuff that comes and goes and like flare ups and things like that so people with like fibro who you know a lot of times are, are relatively high functioning and then will have times where they're just not um, rheumatoid arthritis, where sometimes their hands work great. Sometimes they don't. I think I find those people are often struggle too, because they, they assume when they're having the harder time and their hands aren't working as well, or whatever's not working as well as they, it was yesterday or the week before they have a very hard time, you know, understanding that like it was working yesterday, it'll still work today. We're just going to modify it for you. We don't necessarily need to modify it for the dog because he's got his own thing, right? He's going to do what he needs to do. He's got himself figured out. We need to modify your communication for you, you know, and then often for those clients, I suggest that we just act like you're never going to have good use of your hands, right? If your hands are shady and 50% of the time they, they don't want to function at full capacity, then we just act like they're never going to be that way. And that way, all of our training is accommodating the worst case scenario instead of like optimum spoon use, so to speak. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. I, I totally do that same thing. And that kind of, I know Katie dropped out, but she had the comment about management being that pause button. And I think that's a big thing and why people justify the myth of using punishment is because they don't think they're capable of management. There yeah. are so many different ways that management can be adjusted to a person's disability. Uh -huh. And I mean, leashes are awesome if you have the right leash that fits your environment and what you need. <laughs> well, and, and if you don't, uh, there are like, dozens upon dozens upon dozens upon dozens there's probably hundreds and thousands of makers out there you can probably find someone who can help you make the thing that you're looking for like i work with a company locally and they'll contact me like saying hey we've got somebody who wants us to do this how would we go about doing that to maximize you know da -da -da -da. like a, a, a leash attachment for a wheelchair is what we were looking for. And it needed to be long enough that the dog could get out of the way of the chair when it was rotating and move away from the chair to pick things up if it fell or dropped, but short enough that the dog didn't get anything caught in the wheels or anything else like that. And so we devised, basically it was a bungee leash you know, and we devised an attachment point at the back so that the dog could stretch it if they needed to, but that the attachment point was high enough that it kept clear of the wheels, no matter what the dog was doing. And it stretched and we, we made it like, we did like extra, extra strong bungees. So it was really, really tight. And then it would stretch pretty far, but it would snap back really tight. And so that was like a thing that we came up with to, to manage that. And this is somebody who doesn't, you know, who doesn't have full use of their hands or their hands are busy doing something else. And so, you know, they had been told by other trainers, you, well, you have to use a prong collar to teach this dog to walk, you know, next to you, or you have to use an e-collar or this dog will never, you have to have this dog off leash. You can never have this dog on a leash. And I'm, I'm like, why the hell not? We'll just design something. We'll figure something out. There's got to be a way to do it. And so I think that is a problem. It's that, that especially because the, the organizations training service dogs, quality service dogs are very few and far between and their wait lists are very, very long. So most service dog handlers end up going the owner trained route. And the problem is, is they're not really qualified to be doing that. And so like your guys' group is amazing for that because it provides that resource. Um, and there's a few others. And I think the pandemic really kicked it into high gear. This realization is understanding that, hey, y'all, you can work with trainers online. Like, you know, especially for people with disabilities, how adva advantageous is that, man? You you don't know how you can't drive. Log onto your screen, you know, you, you know, you're just today. You can't get up off the couch. You can't get out of your house log onto your screen. It's okay. Um, and it changes the way we can do things, but I'm not against owner trained service dogs. I just think most people who are doing it probably should be working 
you know, with at least some guidance from a professional to help. Because yeah, when you come up against that problem, I can't get this dog to focus and walk nicely in a leash without a prong collar. Well, okay. But the, the real problem here is that the dog's not focused. <laughs> like The prong collar is not going to change that. <laughs> um, the prong collar is going to stop the dog from pulling. Okay. But he's still not focused. So you will either A, never be able to remove it or B, start running into bigger problems as soon as the external stimuli overrides his concern about what the prong collar is doing to him. You know, and so like we haven't actually addressed the issue. And that's, I think, where experience and, you know, knowledgeable trainers come in is, is you know, people think that the problem is my dog pulls on a leash and, and we're like, actually, the problem is your dog doesn't know how to focus. <laughs> What's your question, Cindy? Exactly why we started the Working Paws group was because yeah. like there, there's so many service dog groups on Facebook. We all know that. And I mean, there's balanced ones there's force for you and you know pick whatever you want to do you're going to find groups with it but there's not many groups that help people that are doing that crossover that are in the process of that and struggling yeah. and like there's so many force free groups that are very adamant like we are not going to talk about prongs in this group I'm like at all ever talk about prongs in my group I will tell you what happened when you use a prong a lot of our trainers have used prongs will they again no <laughs> Yeah, hopefully they not. Yeah, no, they, they know they better work. ways, and when we learn more, we do better. And I, that I, I literally saw somebody with a prong on their year-old lab yes last weekend slap the dog because it was being a puppy instead of coming up with a better solution. But uh, what I like, when possible, is for my online clients to have an in-person trainer that can visually see the dog more easily than I can, but that's not always possible. But it's, having I mean, those resource is really helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an incredible resource. And you're right, a lot of force-free groups won't discuss it. Um, and it's because it devolves into all kinds of other stuff. And it just, it becomes more than a lot of people. Like I'm a moderator for the do no harm group. And we, we just don't discuss it because with 70,000 people, it, it just devolves really fast. And so we just right. have a hard line. Like, that's not what we're here for. We're not going to talk about it. You know, um, ideally we're, we're steering you in a right direction. We're giving you guidance. And then all of our moderators are available for online stuff, you know, and our moderators kind of vary in their specialties. And so we'll try to steer people, you know, towards getting that help that they need. Um, and I, I do think that some people feel more comfortable with in-person, um, but they can, you know, it can be hard to find a qualified trainer, even, even force-free trainers are not all, you know, I would say a, 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 a poorly executed forestry training paradigm is far less risky to your dog's health and um, mental health than, than a balanced, balanced. I hate that term. Um, a compulsion. You. It's because it's not balanced. It's compulsion dependent. Like you are, you are dependent on punishment. You are, you are reliant upon punishing the dog to make your point um, because you can't make your point through reinforcement, which is something else we will discuss in a minute that you can make your point through reinforcement and then not have to punish. Like, you don't have to, you don't have to get mad and upset at your kid for not cleaning their room. If you have adequately reinforced and guided them through the process of cleaning their room, we, we, we never have to punish them for not doing it because they've done it. Problem solved. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, there's, there's plenty of groups that, that want to talk about it and, and do that. And I think, or don't want to talk about it. So I think it's great that you guys will, I think crossing over is hard. I crossed over. Um, for those who don't know, I got my start training um, dogs uh, for police and military application. That was like my first foray into really training beyond my own dogs, right? Like to really training. And you want to talk about something that is polar opposite to what I do now. I mean, polar opposite. Um, and so I understand how hard it is to cross over. Um, I get it. It is really challenging. And it is about changing our mindset as much as it is about changing our action right. and it becomes really it becomes harder and harder to justify the use of punishment and the use of force the more you understand dogs the more you understand how they operate the harder and harder it becomes but having resources to help you you know like okay we're going to cross over and I've got several clients who are crossing over you know who are learning 
now, you know, and I'm, I'm standing there in the room with them in person clients or, you know, even virtual clients. And I'm standing there and I'm like, you know, and they'll, they'll slip up and I, I don't chastise them. I'm like, okay, let's think about how, how can we do this better next time? How can we circumvent that outcome next time? And so, you know, there's a lot of mindset shift and a lot of, um, you know, different, it's hard and it's hard to train a service dog and it's not hard for the reasons people think it's hard. (laughs) Um, The hard part is not teaching them to perform tasks. That's the easy part. The hard part is teaching them how to engage in novel environments when basically every person you encounter is actively attempting to disengage your dog from you. Um, not to generalize the public, but I find that the general public is so much harder to deal with than anything else out there, you know, and especially because my current service dog is really flashy. He's very pretty. Um, when it was my big black lab, he was, you know, ignored, nobody cared. Right. And they're like, Oh, it's a black lab. Nobody cares. He was the best dog on the planet. Um, but my flashy little English shepherd, everybody wants to talk to him and he's very gregarious. So he, he assumes that he's the main character. And so he really likes that. It's very challenging for him um, to not get sucked into like talking to every person that he meets, you know, and things like that. But okay. Are we off track? I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. It's a good conversation. And I mean, yeah, like that. That's a big question that we get a lot. I mean, I did it with Azul. Azul was like totally he is the rock star in every room. Everybody looks at him and yeah. talks about him. Everyone says one of four words, and I'm going to say him quietly because he's sleeping. <laughs> um, those eyes, he's got bright blue eyes. Yeah. Those eyes, gorgeous, beautiful, handsome. Mm-hmm. Everyone says those words all the time. Like we hear them millions of times. There's no way I could count. <laughs> yeah. And so I purposely, like I worked with him using all force free and reinforcement ways of, especially when he was an adolescent and that would steer him the wrong way. I encouraged anytime you heard one of those words from a stranger that it meant focus on me harder. And the more you hear it, the more they talk, focus harder, 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 harder you focus, the more I'm going to reinforce you. And so, yeah, now it's like they... Sometimes he acknowledges them with a smile and a glance their way. And most of the time he just focuses even more and I don't even reinforce it anymore. Oh, that's so clever. With a good boy and whatever. But like for adolescent time frame, I had to use a really high rate of really high value reinforcement to get him to see that point. And now he just takes it as a compliment. He loves it. He hears it. He prances a little bit taller and prouder kind of thing. But he's still focused on me, not them. Yeah. That's my goal. <laughs> Branch uh, waves, you know. He's like, yeah, thank you for acknowledging yeah. me. I am, I am, in fact, the best thing that has ever happened. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, he's very confident dog, like really confident dog. Um, but yeah, that's super clever to get those key words that you hear all the time as a cue. As, as turning it into something that it's like, oh, well, you know, that actually means I need you to look at me right now. Right. That's really clever. It, it was one of the best things I could have done. And I kind of stumbled upon it accidentally. I was really getting kind of into games-based training at that time. Yeah. I turned it into a game. And we always made sure for the longest time, we don't necessarily do it anymore, but we always made sure that we ended whatever we were doing on a chance to say hi and socialize with somebody yeah. either, you know, by the exit door or in the parking lot or something like that. So he knew his needs were going to be met. He knew he was going to be able, and we would stay there and let him socialize as long as he wanted to socialize. So his needs were being met after my needs were being met. And it was a win-win for us all. And yeah, that, that was really like, I stumbled upon it, but it was one of the best things I could have trained him because it helped so much. <laughs> Yeah. Now I'm working on it with my golden. So um, I know you touched on it briefly. We kind of wanted to look at that thought of how punishment, when we use punishment, especially with service dogs, it can be very, very confusing to the dog. For example, I have a really good example, case in point. Um, 
the golden I have right now had had a huge, massive issue with counter surfing and not necessarily resource guarding, but so like she would pick up a piece of trash or something and then bury it so deep in her mouth that like if you wanted to take it away from her, not that I do, but if you wanted to take it away from her, you really had to shove your whole hand into her mouth to be able to get it out was so vetted. And I mean, that's what her previous people would try to do because they were worried about her ingesting something dangerous. Yeah. Get it. But I spent the first two or three days teaching her the value of a good trade. And now she'll trade me anything. And in fact, when she got out of the fence today and was running free, (laughs) she wanted to kind of go sniff. And I came up with an ingenious trade that she wanted because trade has been so reinforced. Recall hasn't been super reinforced yet. She hasn't gotten out of the, you know, the controlled area. But so recall wouldn't have necessarily worked. But the trade, she's so reinforced with that, that like now she doesn't counter surf. Occasionally she'll go shopping for things down low. Like just at the start of the Zoom, she brought me a a lanyard that we use as a tug toy, kind of like a bringsel. And so she did get on the other desk to bring me that, but she doesn't touch food on the counter anymore. And she doesn't go near the counters with foods because she knows if she brings me non-food items, she's going to get food. (laughs) So it's a win-win. She's getting her need met by bringing me stuff that I don't mind if she gets it. (laughs) Yeah. It all with trade, not punishment. Yeah. I did that with my female lab. Um, She was, really pretty ornery resource guarder when I adopted her um like bad like she um and her previous people had tried to teach her um to 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 not resource guard by sticking their hands in the food dish and stuff like that which you know backfired spectacularly because as a six-month-old puppy if you walk near a food dish she'd stiffen up like totally and give you the cold eye you know that one it's just like one more step and it's you're you're gonna lose a finger um and it would just stress her out and it created a dog who was incredibly willing to just basically grab something and shove it down her throat as fast as she could choking hazard toxic anything did not matter just shove it down her throat And so with her, I taught her that I will, we trade for stuff and we trade and we trade, we trade to the the point that she understands commerce. And so now she will see me eating something and go and get me something to trade. Um, And I'm like, I would much rather that than have to constantly be arguing with her because she's a big girl. I don't want to be arguing with you about the countertops. You can easily reach them. Appreciate that. But she won't. She's very good about not doing that anymore. I wouldn't leave her with a turkey sandwich unsupervised, but I wouldn't leave any of my dogs with a turkey sandwich unsupervised. So that's where Roz is right now. Now, as yeah. we totally leave him, but he is not super food motivated. And I could leave anything on the floor and walk out. We built up to that kind of thing. Yeah. I was like, I won't leave food at a surface that she knows that she has pulled stuff off to trade because if I walk out of the room, it's gone. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and that's just, that's just basic management. You know, I've got, I've got a little res dog who was starving at one point in her life. So food is of high priority to her. She was another one that I saw resource guarding as being a potential issue because resources were scarce for her when she was very little. So, I mean, from day one, it was a constant trade, 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 so that she's not worried about me messing around with anything. But she definitely is one who will, she'll straight up climb the counter. She'll climb a bookcase to get to snacks. Like she just, you just don't leave her alone with food problem solved. But if I'm actively in there, you know, working in the kitchen and I'm keeping my eye on her, it's very easy to tell her to walk away or ask her to leave something alone. And she will, Mm -hmm. you know, You know, but she wouldn't do that if I wasn't, if I wasn't monitoring the situation, she'd just be like, excellent. Now it's time for a free for all. Um, But she's definitely the dog who will like, if I am slow in my reinforcement, if I'm not doing it exactly right, she'll cut me out of the equation and just climb the bookcase and get the treats. Like she doesn't care. (laughs) Like She's like, all right, I tried doing it your way. You suck. I'm just going to go get the snacks. Peace out. I don't need you. Um, we joke, like if you were to turn her loose out in the desert again, she'd be fine. (laughs) Like she would just, she'd be fine. She knows exactly how to get, how to survive out there. All right. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. 
um, that we justify the use of punishment. And like I said, for me, most of the time with service dog handlers, I see the justification for prongs and e-collars based on a physical disability, based on, well, I can't, I can't hold on to a leash. I'm like, well, then get a hands-free leash, you know, or um, if this dog pulls at all, I will fall over. And I'm like, okay, then A, use something to stabilize yourself um, and B, teach them not to pull you over. <laughs> um you know, and a prong collar isn't going to solve that. A prong collar is not going to teach the dog not to pull you over. The prong collar is going to prevent the dog from pulling. And that's not the same thing. Um, not, a, it's really, I think it was Susan Friedman. I don't know. I can't remember. Um, said a, an animal can't learn not something. So they can't learn not something. And as humans, we really can't do that either. And I think one of the reasons that we see a lot of kids, especially neurodivergent children who, who get labeled as difficult or problematic or they have behavioral problems um, is because we expect them to not learn something. So we tell them, don't do that. Stop that. But then we provide no information following. <laughs> and that information that follows is actually the, the, the important part. That's what they actually can learn is what to do. They can't not learn. So you can't just say stop and give that information to a dog and expect the dog to understand what that it means. It means don't do that. Okay, well, then what should they do? How long does it take them to come up with an alternative plan? Small kids are a really good example of that. If you come down and you see a kid drawing on the walls and you say, hey, don't do that. And then you walk away. What happens? Maybe they don't go back, back to, to it. draw it on that wall. <laughs> Maybe they choose a different spot on the wall, but they go back to the dang wall, don't they? Right? At some point they go back to it because they didn't what did they learn? They learned that getting caught was a problem, but they didn't learn what they should be doing instead. And they didn't definitely didn't have that artistic expression need met, you know, but if we come in and we see a kid getting ready to color on the walls, we go, "Oh, hey, buddy. You know what? The walls are not for coloring." But you know what is? Here's a giant sheet of paper. Knock yourself out. You know, that gives that is what he learned. So they learned that we don't really color on the walls. The walls are not for coloring. Paper is for coloring. So in terms of talking about with dogs, like pulling on the leash, don't pull on the leash is not really an effective scenario. Okay, well, not pulling on the leash can look like a lot of different things, right? Uh, technically, if the dog's walking all the way over here, they're not pulling on the leash. Technically, if the dog's following behind you, they're not pulling on the leash. You know, not pulling is not really an adequate, you know, don't pull is not adequate information. It's a half of a puzzle. It's A plus blank equals 7,684. Okay, well, what is A equal and what is blank equal? We've got an equation, but there's no information. None of those have values assigned to them. So for pulling, the best way to teach your dog not to pull is to teach them where to be for reinforcement. So I, I don't teach dogs not to pull on a leash. I teach dogs that when we're walking on a leash side by side, when we're walking in a proper heel, these are the, para these are the parameters by which this is the, the scenario. I don't ever teach a dog not to pull. And frankly, I do the exact opposite. I actually teach my dogs to pull. Um, <laughs> I actually put that on a cue because uh, I climb really tall hills and they're very steep. And it's very tiring. And my dogs have a lot more energy than I do. So I just hook those suckers up and sled dog my way up the top, right? On a harness. Uh -huh. So I actively actually teach my dogs to pull on cue. But I, when I'm teaching them to walk to a heel, particularly like my service dog, like I was just, I think it was last weekend, I was looking for some stuff to repair a camper. And so I ended up going to like five different stores. It was exhausting. And my, my branch is with me. My service dog is with me. I had his leash holding it by one finger most of the day, like I literally just like this, you know, and like half the time it was just kind of looped over my shoulder, you know, it's a hands-free leash. So I can be hands-free with him, but I just like was half, I mean, like at one point I caught, I went, I just don't even think like if he decided to leave right now, I, I'm just not going to, he's just going to go. I mean, cause there's nothing stopping him. I am. I am phoning this in on my part. And he was just doing what he needed to do. It's because I taught him that when these certain things are going down, 
this is where we walk. We walk right next to me on my left side. I move, you move. I move, you move. I move, you move. And it's all through reinforcement. He's never worn a prong collar. He's never, he barely wears a collar. The only time he's actually hooked to a collar is when he's working. That's like his cue for working. And then when he's clipped to his harness is more, the rules are a little less strict, right? You can be like, hey, kind of be out in front of me. Just don't drag until I ask you to like dig in, you know? Mm -hmm. And so- but that's how you do it. You don't teach them not to pull. You teach them where the expectation is for reinforcement. This works out best for both of us, you know? Susan and I Garrett have... calls that do land. Huh? Susan Garrett calls that do land. Yeah. We want to live in do land. We want yeah. to tell them what to do. And it's so much like, so the whole reason we started talking about this was confusing when you're using punishment for one thing, and especially if you're using punishment for one thing, like you're jerking that leash for not pulling and then using positive reinforcement for them to be in a heel. So you're bouncing back and forth between the two different techniques. Mm -hmm. and the dog ends up just so totally confused. They don't know what's coming next. Yeah, they and don't. That can be really, really hard. And that is also, often, I think, why the gets justified that it is okay to use the punishment because the reinforcement is not working. And in that case, the reinforcement is only not working because you're using a mix. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and they've done some studies and I think it was Eileen Anderson who wrote about it. Um, she wrote an incredible blog piece about it um, with a lot of research citations and stuff about that when the brain is seeking the brain can only do one thing at a time in terms of it can either be avoiding something or working towards something. And it can't be doing both in the same, like the synapses that are responsible for that, the chemical, the biochemical process that is responsible for those three things are not capable of operating in the same moment. So your dog can't simultaneously be, I don't want to be punished. I want, to, but I'm going to get reinforcement. They can't be doing both in the brain, the brain can't process both of those things at the exact same moment. So your dog's either doing one or the other. They're either working towards reinforcement or they're working to avoid punishment. And you as the human are not in charge of either of those scenarios. You have no say in which one the dog is actually doing. So you can't be certain which one is actually being effective. If one is being effective over the other one, why are you using the other one? And in my, in our case, we happen to know there's a giant mountain of studies available um, with decades of research at this point, 20, 30 years of research that indicates that reinforcement is actually more effective, that seeking reinforcement, that moving towards reinforcement is both biologically appropriate for dogs and psychologically much more beneficial and way less confusing. I mean, how confusing is it? And it's confusing for humans too. If you get punished all the time, it creates a lot of distrust. You know, you can't really necessarily fully enjoy your reinforcement because you're like, eh, yeah, okay, I did it, but I did it under duress. I don't, mm -hmm. they don't want to do it. They're not, they're not down there just being like, yeah, let's do, this. I'm, I'm ready. I'm doing it. They're, they're doing it because what's the other option? They have no other option. There's, there's no availability to not do things. Um, it was Amy Cook said a yes from an animal means very little. A, a, a yes means very little from an animal who can't say no. And that's where, you know, the so-called the, the compulsion reliant, the balanced trainers get into so much problematic behavior and so much stuff that like they just your dog can't say no. It, I don't care that he's doing it and he appears to you to be having a good time. To me, he looks stressed as hell, but he can't say no. So why does it matter that he does it? You know, like, is, is that good exactly. training? I don't think so. I, I mean, I wouldn't think it was good training in a kid either. Your kid is well-behaved because the other option is they get smacked. So not really well-behaved, right? Like your kid's not really well-behaved. They don't really know what to do. They are just actively avoiding being hurt, you know? And that gets really hinky and it gets very confusing because the brain can't switch between those two things really readily. It's, it can't just go, well, whew, I'm not going to be punished. Ooh, reinforcement. You know, they can't, it's very hard to do that. And it's very stressful and it causes a lot of problems. Um, it does in humans too. We call it anxiety. Um, 
<laughs> in dogs, it's a little harder to diagnose, but same basic problem. And when we get down into that and we start doing those two things, now let's talk about an animal who needs to be able to tell you when you are having a problem. So guide dogs are a great example. If, if somebody asks their guide dog to cross the street and there's a car coming, that dog has got to be able to say, hey, no, we cannot. Not safe. Can they do that if every time they've made a mistake, quote unquote, they've been punished? I mean, I don't think they can. Like, how could you, how could you trust them to make that decision when they, every time they've made a wrong decision, they've been punished for it. So you create a dog who will make no decisions, which is very problematic with a service dog because the service dog's job is to make choices when I am incapable of making them. You know, my service dog is for psychiatric. I have PTSD for those who don't know and ADHD. So like I get like an extra dose of anxiety um, on top of that. I have got to be able to know that when I'm having an issue and I'm not acknowledging that, that my brain is just like, we're fine. You know, my pulse is skyrocketing. My cortisol skyrocketing. I need to be able to know that Branch will put his foot down and say, absolutely, we are not okay. We're not okay. We are not going further. This scenario is not good for you until I can come to my better senses and be like, oh yeah, you know, you're right. This is not a healthy place for me to be. Can we leave? Can you help me leave? I'm starting to freak out and stress and I've lost track of what's going on. Where is the exit? Let's get the hell out of here. I need to be able to trust that he can make those choices and not blithely be ignored when I, when he says, Hey, you're having a problem. I need him to feel confident enough to say that. And how can he possibly say that if he says, hey, um, I don't really like this scenario. And I say, too bad, pop on the prong collar. You have to do it anyways. Like, at which point, you know, I've completely undone every value that he serves. So Uncle actually had to get me out of the grocery store yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, it. they need to have that way of telling us, hey, Whatever the medical issue is, you know, it can be so many different things, but we can't, we, I'm not willing to put my life in my dog's hands if they're fearing that by saying that they're going to be punished in some way. Exactly. Like, how can you, how can you trust them to make that decision on your behalf? If every time they've made a decision you don't agree with, you punish them for it, exactly. you know, and and like, like we said earlier, like dogs can do one thing at a time, right? Like just they're one, they're, they cannot multitask. They just cannot. Um, and most humans don't multitask as well as they think they do. Um, like, I think, I think we're like, we can multitask. Yeah, you kind of half-ass everything. Um, but dogs are really one track minded. They're really one, one thing at a time. I'm going to do the thing that's right in front of me and then I'll do the next thing, et cetera. And so if your dog is constantly having to check themselves in order to avoid being punished they can't really do their job but on flip side of that if they are working for reinforcement if they are conditioning into a reinforcement paradigm which i i, I worked branch five four hours last weekend last saturday four hours and didn't did all accomplish my goals but i was trying um, four hours and I, man, I don't think I handed him a single cookie the entire time. The most reinforcement he got from me was a good job, buddy, you know, and, and I would talk to him and I would tell him he's doing good. And I give him a pat, you know, when we'd stop, that was it. Like, I didn't have to use reinforce. I didn't have to use treats. I didn't have to use toys. I didn't have to make a big production of it, but he is so conditioned to, these are the expectations. These are what we do. This is how we do it. This is how we ride our bicycle. He doesn't have to think about it anymore. Therefore, I don't have to think about it anymore. And that's wonderful, you know, but if my dog's doing things the right, the right thing all the time, I don't have to punish them. And like, like we mentioned earlier, you know, the, the people will come out and be like, well, when I get my dog outside, he can't focus on anything and he's running around. So I have to use a prong collar because I can't control him. And it's like, well, you've, you've, you've haven't solved your problem. Because your problem is, is your dog is not focused. Your dog is not engaged with you. Your dog is overstimulated by his environment. You have not solved any of that. Instead, you've slapped a prong collar on it and called it a day. But you really haven't addressed what the problem is. And I think that is where novice trainers and new owner trainers come really struggle is this idea that they, I think that is primarily the problem with compulsion tr trainers as well and, and balanced trainers 
is that they come at the problem from the wrong direction. They come at the problem from the, the, the consequence instead of the antecedent. And the antecedent is where your answer lies. Fixing the antecedent solves everything else down the line. Starting at A always fixes B and C, right? Antecedent behavior consequence. That's your, that's your, that is, that is how, that is how all living beings with the central nervous system operate. All of us, um, regardless, regardless of species, we haven't, you know, as far as I know, been able to experiment around with a bunch of alien life forms to find out if other beings on other planets um, operate under the same circumstance. But from goldfish to, you know, grizzly bears, antecedent behavior consequence. That is how we learn. And so if we are only answering the consequence, so if if the behavior is the dog is pulling on the leash, so we're going to punish them for that so that they stop pulling, that we we have completely ignored everything in the antecedent category. We've completely ignored all of the things that caused the behavior. So all we've done is come here. And it was Dr. Jesus Morales Ruiz who said, the worst time to fix a problem is after it's already happened. Punishment is not an effective time. So we're back to the kid cleaning the room, right? If you punish him for not cleaning his room, that's not really an effective way to motivate him for starters to cleaning his room and to, you know, to teach him that cleaning his room is beneficial. It's basically like, he's only going to do it to avoid being punished, but is, I mean, we don't even need to go there. If we come all the way to the start of this equation and say, Hey, this is how I need you to clean your room. We're going to do it X, Y, and Z. And then we get the behavior, we get the antecedent arrangement so that the behavior is what we want. And the consequence can be what we want, which is the room is clean and we didn't have to get mad about it. We didn't have to get upset about it. You know, the dirty dishes made it to the sink, you know, things like that. And it's just, it's always punishment comes at the question from the wrong answer. It comes, it comes from the wrong position. It comes from the answer instead of asking what, what we really need, you know? And so I get that a lot with like, even outside of service dogs, well, my dog barks and odd things all the time. Okay. Well, what do you want him to do? I want him to not bark. Can't not learn something, right? Not barking is not a thing. It's not an active thing. Yeah. Come from the land of do. What should he be doing instead? Well, I would uh, decide what it is. It can be, it can be stupid, simple. It can be sit. It can be touch my hand. It can be chase a ball down the down the hallway. It can be anything. Just this is what I need you to do right now. Um, uh, it was uh, Susan Friedman who who we were discussing um, splitting and this idea of breaking behaviors down into their smallest increments. And she said for animals that tend to vocalize a lot, she said, well, what does the question she would ask is what does quiet look like? What does a dog do when they are quiet? And the answer is like, well, their mouth is closed, right? So start there. Start rewarding them for keeping their mouth shut. Your mouth is closed, reward. Even if it goes closed and then reopens again to scream, at least here, benefit of a clicker, you know, is like, boom, right here. We got it. And so that's how we change the, we change it. We don't have need. We don't have to punish you for barking if we're reinforcing you for quiet, for your mouth being closed. And technically it's quiet, but it's not, not something. What's up, Cindy? I was just going to say, I use that with both my dogs. Um, Penny can attest to this. I had a real big problem anytime we did a Zoom with the dogs barking, being obnoxious. And I started rewarding them for barking and stepped backwards and rewarded them for being quiet it, as they were able to modulate their voices and mm -hmm rewarded them for being quiet we went through a phase with I went through a phase with both of them trying to do action prompting to get cookies for being quiet but the result has been you know yeah. poodle sound asleep and a great Pyrenees sound asleep it took time but I think most people the a, a problem people we get into as positive reinforcement force-free trainers is a lot of people want an instant fix and to get lasting results it's not an instant fix. You have to work from the, oh, this is what I see as a problem. Where does that problem start and how do I stop it? What how is, do I prevent it? What is driving and, that? You know, we yeah. both are basically are out hard. of time, but I do want to touch on our very last big myth if people want to hang around and go a little bit longer. 
Yeah, um, I'm 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 totally clear. I cleared my schedule for today because I had no idea how many spoons this was going to take out of me. Yeah. Um, but also, um, yeah, Cindy, that is such a the myth of like that force retraining takes a long time. Um, that's one that I love to debate with people. Um, the question that I always ask is, do you want the problem solved or do you want the dog to stop? So those are two different questions and they can have basically the same result. The result is the unwanted behavior ceases to stop, but they will have two very different approaches. If you want the problem just solved, management is your key, right? My dog gets into the trash or my dog counter surfs. Well, you want the problem solved, stop giving them things to counter surf and get it, put the trash behind a door. Problem solved. Now, do you want the dog to stop that behavior? That's going to take some more time. And some more effort on your part, not as much as you think, but more than you want, but we all want an instant fix. And I think that's where the prong collars, especially get this idea is like, well, it solved my problem. It did it solve your problem or did it solve the problem the dog was having? Cause your problem and the problem the dog was having were two different problems. Your problem was the dog was pulling. The dog's problem was you weren't going over there to check out that rose bush that smells amazing because every dog in the neighborhood peed on it today. And I need to check the mail. Like you, you and the dog were having two different problems. Now you've solved your problem, but what about the dog's problem? The dog's problem has not been fixed, has not been resolved. So now you've got a dog who's going to be frustrated about stuff too, because they're not getting their needs met because their needs while they're outside are being ignored. The fact that they're overstimulated, they're over threshold, they're not getting this opportunity to do things, you know? And I think somebody had posted in the chat early on that one of the myths that they hear all the time is that service dogs never get any time off. And if, if, if you are operating in a situation where your service dog does not get time off, your dog will have a very, very short career because they're going to burn out. <laughs> they're not going to last. They're going to be four years old, five years old, and their behavior is just going to plummet. Actually, most of the time we see these dogs about two or three, they start to uh, develop reactivity, et cetera. And invariably, when I see someone online posting about, well, he's become reactive, et cetera, they use prong collars and shock collars on these dogs. And I'm like, there you go. There's there's a correlation here. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you that it's a definitive but it's definitely some smoke, <laughs> you know, like I'm seeing smoke. Um, but yes, after the fact, I will stick around if anybody wants to chat. Um, 